So I once knew this woman who told me that she gets angry with the Bible. She told me she gets angry with the Bible, and when I asked her why, she said that her husband would was new to Christianity and he would have his friends over for dinner, and they would pick up a Bible and they would just let it fall open. They'd let the pages fall wherever, and they would read out the most obscure passage in the Bible, and then they would just laugh at how strange it all sounded. And many of us, um, many of us here, have been led to believe that the Bible makes good sense, makes good common sense for our lives, that the Bible is this common sense guide for living good lives. Many of us would would be angry too, like this woman, if these guys poke fun of this thing we think makes good sense to us in front of us. We, we, We believe that the Bible is fundamentally about about us living good lives. And so of course it should speak to us straightforwardly in language that we can understand and that cannot be misconstrued or misused like they did. But the truth is that the Bible is not about us or how we should live. It's not about us at all. Thank God. For us, the Bible is about God. And our efforts to translate the truth about God into more or less useful guides to living are really never as tidy as we would like them to be. Take this morning's reading, for instance, from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus is surrounded by tax collectors and sinners, it says. In other words, people whose style of living made them ritually unclean and morally reprehensible. And and the one thing that Israel was called to be above all was holy, right? Remember those words from Leviticus, be holy as I, your God, am holy. This this was the aim of the Pharisees, to make sure in, in... in the minutest particulars of daily life, that all people of Israel were holy. And there was no way in the world that tax collectors and sinners could ever be holy. So the Pharisees and the scribes said, if this Jesus were truly God, truly holy, he'd be keeping well away from those other people. But then Jesus tells two stories. If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one goes missing, surely he would leave all the 99 and go after the one that was lost. And then having found the lost sheep, he would, he would lay the animal on his shoulders and he would rejoice and throw a party. And on, on returning home, he would this grand party for his friends and neighbors and he'd invite everyone. Likewise, Jesus said, if if a woman had ten silver coins and one goes missing, surely she would scour her entire house. She would search the entire house without pause until she found the one coin. And on discovering the one coin, she would have this grand party and invite all her friends and neighbors. Now when we read these stories, tuned in as we are to assuming the Bible is saying something about us and how we ought to live. Something to guide us in good living. We may think to ourselves, well, there are some pretty bad people out there. And some of those people have made a hefty profit out of sin like those tax collectors, and others have undoubtedly hurt themselves and just made a mess of their lives. Jesus calls them those sinners. But I guess we should instead be generous and open-minded and caring people. We should be like the shepherds 
who search out and uplift and guide the lost. And, and the careful housekeepers who treasure each and every coin, each and every person we encounter. And so thinking it's about us and how we ought to live and using the Bible as this guide for living, we become people who do good. We become patrons, benefactors, philanthropists, people who out of our generosity stoop down to give a hand up to a person in need, who lower ourselves to let others know they are good enough while giving them something that is more than good, good enough. But, but becoming these people who do good, becoming patrons and benefactors and philanthropists and even servants, is not what these parables are about. And let me tell you a little secret. It's not what most of the Bible was about. <laughs> We often think it's about us and how we ought to live. How we ought to love. What we should do. But these stories are not about us. These stories are fundamentally about God. The Pharisees actually realize this better than we tend to. The Pharisees would have been deeply insulted to think that Jesus would have compared them to a lowly shepherd and they would have definitely been deeply insulted to be compared to a woman Jesus isn't just calling the Pharisees to be a bit more generous he is calling them to repentance to a complete reversal of the way of seeing and being in the world. The point of these two parables is not for us to identify with the shepherd and the woman to allow these archetypes to guide our lives so that we can move from being people who are good enough into being people who are respected and admired and deemed good for what we do and give. Maybe even great people. The point of these parables is that we are not and never will be the shepherd or the woman. We are the sheep. We are the lost coin. God is the shepherd. God is the searching woman. That's right, I just said God is a searching woman. God is the one who takes the astonishing risk of leaving the 99 sheep in order to come and look for us. God leaves the 99 sheep a journey of danger and daring and devotion, a journey we could call the passion. God is the one who carefully, thoughtfully seeks us out like a woman meticulously searching for a coin, and we are the sheep and the lost coin who are good enough to be sought after. What Jesus is saying is whoever you are, Pharisaic lawmaker or sinful lawbreaker. This is not a story about you. It's a story about God. And the way to allow yourself to become a part of the story is not by making the Bible a manual for good living or becoming a good person, but to stop running away, to stop hiding from the one who yearns and searches for you. Few people have understood these parables better than Francis Thompson. You may know him as a poet. Francis Thompson was born into a well-to-do Catholic family in Manchester, England. And in 1859, um, he was sent to a boarding school to prepare himself to be a priest. When it became clear his vocation lie elsewhere, he was sent to train like his father as a physician. But his studies as a physician made him miserable. And, and after the death of his mother, he, he started to take opium. He came to London at the age of 26, and he just fell into this life on the streets of facing hunger and disease and drug addiction. And, and two years pass, and he's on the verge of, 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 of suicide. 
the mental toll too much when, when, he, when he's befriended by this prostitute. She takes him in and she cares for him throughout the winter and encourages him to write it out. To just write it out, to write poetry, to deal with his own mental anguish and his own sense of failure. And two astonishing events happen because of this. First, a literary editor published one of his poems and, and began a close friendship that was to endure for the rest of Thompson's life. And, and second, the prostitute, whose name is still unknown, she recognized that Thompson, with his published poems now, had found this place of, of peace among new friends. And, and eventually, she just kind of disappeared from his life. And her last words for him were, they won't understand our friendship. But there is no word in the Christian vocabulary for the publication of that initial poem, but providence. And there is no word for the ministry of that prostitute with him in his life but Holy Spirit. A little over a century ago, shortly before his death, Thompson wrote a poem in which he recognized that all of his life he had been running away. And fundamentally, the one he had been running away from was not his father, as he'd like to narrate in every therapist's appointment, <laughs> but from God. His own life, he realized, was secondary to that fundamental narrative, which was and has always been God's relentless pursuit of him. That celebrated poem is now called The Hound of Heaven. I plan to put it on the screen, but it begins like this. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him. In, the, in this poem, Thompson explains he, why he's fleeing. He admits that though he always knew the love of God followed him, pursued him, he dreaded turning towards it all this time because he... It meant he must lay himself aside. It meant that he would have to recognize that the story was never about him. This hound of heaven is one and the same with the, the woman searching for the lost coin. And the shepherd searching for the stray sheep. And the father searching and waiting and waiting and waiting for his son. Each one of these, God in Christ, who searches us out and knows us, who, who comes to us in any form, we can receive him, even, even astonishingly for Thompson, in the form of a prostitute, simply because he is the love that will not let us go. In a few minutes from now, after this service, we are going to turn our gaze and our prayers and our hands towards serving our community, towards providing food and stocking the, the hawk pantry that will feed local student, students in our area who are, live in poverty and who, who experience food insecurity. And as I hinted to earlier, if we see today's parable as about us, if we see ourselves as the shepherd and the woman, then in such work we just become patrons and benefactors and philanthropists and do-gooders. Where we who recognize our own social privilege offer to give a hand up to those who are less fortunate. But we are people who are learning to read these parables and the Bible as a whole in a whole different way. We are not the searchers. We are not the rescuers, the hand extenders. We are the found. We are the rescued. We are the people who grab on to that hand. God is the hound that tracks us down. However hard and fast we are determined to run away. And if we, and if we have discovered the joy of being found, have you discovered the joy of being found? If you've discovered the joy of being found, how much we long to share that joy with others who have made a similar discovery who know like us how profoundly 
They have tried to flee. This word is, is not one in which we, this work back here is not one in which we, we, we do good or we, we do the seeking or we do the finding. The work that we will do today, it is the one in which we experience again the goodness of God that is always good enough and the joy of being found time and time again us being found time and time again there is nothing more real than that so here we were thinking thinking our heart longings of faith and our journey and ourselves is what the story is all about but here's the good news. The story is about God, the hound of heaven. God in Christ who leaves the 99. God in Christ who, who scours the whole house for you. God in Christ who wrestled with sin and death day and night on the cross and in the tomb so that we might be found in that, that morning resurrection light. We often think it's about us, but this life of faith is not some heroic journey. Life of faith is, is just the acceptance of being found. Maybe that's what you need to hear today. That the life of faith is just the acceptance of being found and that that's good enough. Would you pray with me? God, we once were lost, but now we're found. You have rescued wretches like us. And the work of the gospel, the work of this church, the living out of, of courageous conversation and creative community and collaborating for the common good, we do out of having been found first. Knowing such a joy, God, in being found in you that we can't help but share it with others. God, I pray for those in this room today who are watching online, those people in our lives who are running Slow us down. Maybe even trip us up. That we might fall on our knees and realize it's not about us. We pray this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.